Bees pollinate 70 of 100 main crop species that feed 90% of the world. Without the work of bees, we'd have about half the amount of vegetables and fruits that currently fill the produce department at your local grocery store. They're responsible for more than $15 billion in increased crop revenue each year. And as the populations decline, we face what we faced with not only financial losses, but risk affecting the entire ecological and biological systems that bees are a critical part of. But it isn't just bees that are disappearing from our habitats. Butterflies, in particular monarch butterflies, are disappearing at a terrifying rate. So why should we care? Well, butterflies and moths in particular are indicators of healthy environments and ecosystems. If we're doing things correctly, bees and butterflies should be abundant. See, butterflies aren't just pretty creatures. They're food for birds and bats. Birds and bats that control other insect populations that left unabated could destroy crops. And those birds are food for predators that keep bird populations from getting too large. Once again, destroying crops or upsetting the balance of ecosystems we depend on to live and breathe. So what is killing these bugs off? Well, no one seems to want to admit the obvious causes because it might cut into their bottom line. One is neonicotinoids, a class of pesticides used almost universally on crops grown in the United States. And while the companies making the pesticides continue to assert claims that neonicotinoids are the most safe and that as long as they're used properly, it really isn't that big of a deal. Which is strange since the European Commission has banned at least three kinds of neonicotinoids, citing risk to bees particularly as the reason. Another cited reason for the ever expand is the ever expanding industrial farming market. See, many fields that were once filled with wildflowers are now being tilled under to grow food crops, which wouldn't be so bad if food waste wasn't such a problem. In fact, a recent study showed that between 31 and 40 percent of the American food supply goes to waste, and most of that is the very fruits and vegetables being grown in fields that once provided food for bees and butterflies. But look, it's not as if we can't do anything to abate the problem. The USDA actually came up with an app, which is going to help Americans waste less food, which could lessen the need for industrial farmers to grow more GMO and pesticide-laden foods that just go to waste on lands these insects need to survive. In addition, the White House announced a plan to create a pollinator highway along the I-35 corridor between Mexico and Minnesota, which is the main migration pattern for monarch butterflies. See, science is even finding new careers for bees. New research suggests that bees could replace dogs in drug sniffing. Turns out they can be trained and retrained much more effectively than dogs to find different kinds of drugs. So, if the threat of bee and butterfly extinction could have such a catastrophic ecological and financial effect on our nation and the world, why are elected officials and oversight agencies turning a blind eye to the obvious connections? Uh, Canada right now is on the verge of destroying civilization. That's almost literally true. If Canada proceeds with tar sand development in Alberta, uh, the effects could be really dire if Obama approves the XL pipeline, which will then accelerate the tire sands development, and uh, that continues. Uh, the effects on human life could be really severe. How much is being done about it? Well, you can tell me. And it's, this is not small. It's not like uh, uh, stopping a war across the ocean is very important, but destroying human civilization is more important. And, it's, and the cho cho choices are right before us. And uh, you know very well how people are dealing with it, all of us. And for Canada, it's particularly important. Uh, one thing you point out is that uh, after talks, dealing with activists in, in developed nations like Canada and the US, you often get the question, well, what can I do? Whereas when you go to, to developing nations like Colombia or you talk to the Kurds in, in Turkey, they don't ask you what to do, they tell you what they're, they're doing. I just came back from Turkey and the same thing. I was there, happened to be there this time, uh, partly for protests about repression of Kurds, but uh, 
the main, the main invitation was for a, a talk at a memorial for a, an assassinated journalist, Front Dink, been assassinated a couple of years ago too, because he was exposing Armenian uh, atrocities a century ago, uh, which really broke. Uh, uh, it was probably the government was behind his assassination. It's kind of obscure, but that's what it looks like. Anyway, it was a bad call because the assassination aroused enormous concern and involvement. And so, for example, at this memorial, uh, uh, there was also a de huge demonstration uh, of people going through uh, uh, Istanbul, a uh, uh, big demonstration at the site of the assassination. Uh, uh, people really engaged. There's been a lot of it further exposure of what happened, the efforts to try to overcome some of the you know, re re rehabilitating, rebuilding, destroyed churches and things. And, about, and I was talking mainly to activists, people who were there. But, but, and these are, and you know, being an activist in Turkey is a lot harder than in Canada or U.S. It's a pretty repressive state. There's a lot of um, state violence. There's, it has, for example, more journalists in jail than any other country in the world. It's the world champion, and it's increasing. But they're very, uh, they're very courageous. They're um, uh, energetic. They, uh, they want to talk to you about what they're Pollen doing. Red on and, their legs. Help. and that's normal. Uh, for us, it's easy. I mean, we're very privileged. Yeah. I mean, there's some repression, but by comparative standards, we live in very free societies. And there isn't a lot that the government can do to you, especially you know, people like us, you know, who, who are part of the privileged sector. We go to college, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, there's just endless opportunities. I mean, I just mentioned one tar sands, but can go on listing any number of others. A closer look at a shocking new study which says that the Earth is currently in the middle of the first stages of the first great mass extinction since the age of the dinosaurs. That study, which was just published in the journal Sciences Advanced, uh, found that over the past century plus, vertebrate species have vanished at a rate almost 114 times faster than average. That's right, not one, not two, not 50, but 114 times faster than average. There, these species are dying and vanishing. The study also found that as many as 447 different vertebrate species have disappeared just since 1900. A mind-boggling statistic because it usually takes between 800 and 10,000 years for that many species to disappear. The authors of this study say that such an exceptional loss of biodiversity can only mean that a sixth extinction is already underway. So if that's the case, what's causing this planet-wide holocaust? And what, if anything, can we do to stop it? With me now for more on this is one of the authors of the extinction study, Professor Paul R. Ehrlich, being professor of population studies and president of the Center for Conservation at Stanford University. Professor Ehrlich, welcome back. Nice to be here. It's great to have you. Those are shocking numbers, vertebrate species disappearing at a rate 114 times higher than average. What's going on? Why is this happening? Well, uh, what we're doing is sawing off the limb we're sitting on. Uh, we've done a very conservative study of species extinction, which is the end of the process. In other words, we're losing populations that are our life support systems much, much more rapidly than that. And of course, the basic cause is the scale of the human enterprise. There are many too many people. The rich are consuming much too much. Uh, and we're not doing anything about it. It's very, very similar to the climate situation, of course, which is very tightly tied into it because the extinctions uh, are in part going to be caused by climate change. And the more extinctions you have, the worse the climate change is going to be. So uh, we're in a really tough situation. And our estimate is more conservative than previous ones, and we suspect it's much too low. In other words, the actual rate of species extinctions over all organisms, not just over uh, mammals, which is where our study was, uh, is likely to be thousands of times already the background rate. And the background rate is just the rate at which species went extinct normally in between the giant uh, mass extinction episodes, the last one of which most people remember was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs bit the dust. Right. Um, things have really ticked up since 1900. Um, is, do you think that's because in 1900 there were fewer than 2 billion people on the planet? 
or is that because we've been burning fossil fuels like there's no tomorrow since roughly 1900? Well, it's a whole series of things that we've done. We have increased the, after all, when I was born in 1932, there were 2 billion people on the planet. Now there's 7.3 billion people that we're trying to feed. One of the great so destroyers of biodiversity is our agricultural activities, just like that's one of the main causes of climate change. And of course, we've equipped our, we've increased our weapons. In other words, the, uh, we, we now can chop down forests by uh, pulling giant balls between giant bulldozers, which weren't around in, in 1900 and so on. So uh, our technology has allowed us to become much, much more destructive. Um, and the size of our population has made it much more difficult for us to be democratic and to discuss these issues reasonably. Uh, remember, the uh, founding fathers were concerned with how many people a single representative could represent and came up with about 30,000 people. Mm. And now our average, average uh, representative is trying to represent 800,000 people. So we're losing democracy, we're losing our life support systems, and we don't have any leadership to deal with it. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty grim analysis. Um, can you explain for our viewers um, exactly what an extinction is and why, as human beings who you know, we're smart, we figure things out, uh, why that's a problem for us? Well, what's happening is we're losing population after population of the organisms we share the planet with. Uh, a good example for, exa for now uh, is what's happening to the honeybee, which gives us about $18 billion worth of nutritional value a year in the United States. It's an organism that originated in the old world has come over here and we use it to pollinate the crops because we've already wiped out most populations of native pollinators in North America. And now the honeybee is getting into trouble. Uh, and eventually the honeybee may go extinct as a species, but if just all the populations in North America die out, we're, eight, we're short of $18 billion uh, worth of, uh, uh, of value. So population after population goes extinct, when they're all gone, and it's often difficult to tell when they're all gone, then of course the species is extinct. So when you're measuring the species extinction, you're at the most conservative end because we need the populations. If there, if there was one population of honeybees left in Italy, it wouldn't do us any good at all, yet the species extinction would not have been checked up. Right, and, and so when do and how do humans go extinct? Not a, human beings hopefully won't go extinct, but civilization very well may. But each one of the previous, the, the five previous mass extinctions, and even some of the smaller ones like the PETM, um, the principal animals that went extinct were the top predators. They were the largest animals and they were the ones that, the, and you know, we're the top predator on earth, are we not? Uh, oh yeah, we're the top predator both on land and on sea, but we are an extremely adaptable species. We did last a long time. You got to remember, uh, industrial civilization is, is a blip on the time scale. Uh, and uh, we, we went for several hundred thousand years as modern homo sapiens hunting and gathering. And some surviving groups may manage to do that. The issue is, are we going to lose the kind of civilization that you and I and the listeners to this program value? And there, uh, we don't know yet. We, we could probably change our course and I'm optimistic about that. But what I'm very pessimistic about looking at the political situation is whether we will change our course. Right. And, and just, just to, to put a fine point on this, when you, you mentioned rich people twice, you know, basically overconsuming, I'm assuming that what you're talking about is not like the Koch brothers buying another Mercedes. What you're talking about is the rich nations who are living a lifestyle that is disproportionate to that of the rest of the world. Or do I have that wrong? That, that, that's, that's correct. But of course, even in the rich nations, as we see in, with the, uh, uh, the Hood Robin program that Reagan started in the United States of taking money from the poor and giving it to the rich, uh, even in the rich nations like the United States, there are people who do not have proper diets, not because of their choices, but because of the amount of money they have. Right. Uh, so yeah, the basic problem is too much consumption of junk and not thinking about, you know, what kind of better lives we might lead and what kind of a better society we might make. You can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. Infinite growth is the creed of the cancer cell. There you go.
Professor Paul Ehrlich, thank you so much for being with us tonight, sir. It's my pleasure as always. Thank you.